up for 12 to 14 minutes a night when he's on the court. He should be your rim running 36 minutes a night big, but he is someone who can play in your rotation. And then, of course, you have um, Davion, uh, Davion Mitchell, who we haven't mentioned yet, who really, really yes. flashed as a defender. So when you look at that, you have him, and then you obviously have the Flyers, like in the Jeremy Lamb. Maybe he's healthy and fine next year. But like yeah. they have eight or nine guys that I think you can trust, and it's not a young team. I think people just they look at the Kings as a younger team because they've been rebuilding and losing. It's like they're not young. Like they're even Keegan young. Murray, they're all the young guys are gone, and De'Aaron Fox is older now. Like this is a team that should win a lot more than thirty games next year, and I think Kevin Herter will be a really good player for them uh, next year. And I think uh, the wing depth is going to be fun. I think the Kings will be a fun watch. Um, number five, Absolutely. and this might surprise you that he's not higher up on this list, but biggest offseason move number five for me, uh, DeAndre Ayton returning to the Suns. He did not make my top four. I, I just don't think it matters. Like I, in terms of who I have in front of him, where I think the Suns would have been fine. Uh, this is going to be maybe too much of a take, but like, uh oh, uh oh, here we go. I mean. Clint Capella, Miles Turner. I don't think they're all that concerned about the five spot. Like they're like, we'll pay you and we're fine with you. And like, you're a good player. You're not a max player, but you got a max offer sheet. So we'll, we're not losing you for nothing, but he's not a needle mover. Like it's still just like, if Chris, it comes down to Chris Paul's health, uh, Mikhail Bridges continuing to evolve, uh, Devin Booker con- continuing to evolve. And you know, that's about it. Like, that's what they have to do. And I just, I, I don't look at DeAndre Aiden like as that big of it. Like he swings where they can go next year. I think there's a reason that they were, and eh, we're not giving you the max. Like we're just not a believer because like, I am just terrified of bigs who, and I like when the Atlanta rumors were popping up, I'm like, he's not a better fit in Atlanta than Clint Capella. Clint Capella knows exactly what he is with Trey Young and the Spanish pick and rolls. And he knows exactly rim run. He and Trey have a great relationship. He knows what he is. He has skill sets. Like he's a great rebounder, great finisher, that sort of thing. Good at blogging shots when he's healthy and all that. DeAndre Aiden doesn't have an elite skill. Like that hasn't happened yet. Like he's not an elite rebounder. He's not an elite getting to the rim guy. He's not an elite defender. He's a good defender. He's a good scorer. He is good at a lot of stuff. He's not even a good three point corner three shooter. He's not like he's just good at a lot of stuff. And I just worry about bigs who are either not like it's like you're either Joel Embiid and Nikola Jokic. And then we're like, we'll max you out and build the offense around you. Mm-hmm. Or you better be like Rashawn Holmes, Clint Capella or um, insert just other roaming big here that's just three and d like rim running like he's just not one of those so he's in this weird middle ground that i don't know really all that matters like for where phoenix is going and like i wouldn't be surprised if he's not on this roster after the trade deadline like i I still don't think this is a marriage that's built to last but you're in phoenix you've seen a lot more of deandre than myself do you think he should be higher am i under Am I underplaying DeAndre Ayton's impact to the Suns year over year? I don't think so. I think, I mean, for just from just being in Phoenix, I mean, it's kind of like mixed. Like, I think he, you bring him back. I mean, mm. he's a young center. He has shown potential. He has produced, like, big reason why you're after the finals, you know. At the same time, I don't, like, you haven't seen him. Like you said, he hasn't really significantly stepped up in a major way. Like, okay, one of the preeminent centers in our league at insert here. You know what I mean? It hasn't happened. Now, for me, I don't know if part of it is just the fact that when you have a point guard like Chris Paul, it kind of marginalized centers, almost like if you have another guy who can create off the off the dribble with some, you know, uh, from scratch creation playing alongside Mm -hmm. LeBron, like certain players, like your skill set is just just severely kind of mitigated or limited because the type of player that they are, you know, so like you're not going to dump the ball into DeAndre Ayton and say, do something for the post. Not while Chris Paul is the point guard. You know what I mean? Well, I have a, I have a stat for you on that. <laughs> yeah, let's get it. True or false? JaVale McGee had a higher usage percentage than DeAndre Ayton last year in Phoenix. No, no, don't tell. Don't yes. Say that. yes. 19.3 for JaVale McGee, 18.5 <sighs> for DeAndre Ayton. That's what I'm saying. Like, he's not a factor. 18.5 usage rate? That's insane. Devin Booker's up to 30. Like, that's the mm-hmm. superstar average. 18 is like less than DeAndre Hunter. And that's like, what, that's like a Tony Snell getting cardio in. Like that is that's, nothing. That's true. But how much of that do you put on Aiton for, is he not being mm. more aggressive? And how much do you put that on the guys who demand the ball? Like so many Phoenix Suns games, I felt like it was like, okay. Booker, you're a number one option. 
All right, cool. Chris Paul, number two. Mm. All right, cool. Third, mm, let's see. Jay Crowder, uh, Mikel Bridges. Uh, hey, we got campaign. you. Hey, campaign at 20%. Campaign too. Yeah. That's exactly. So it's like, I just don't think he was put in a position where, yes, like you could say it's kind of like, it's not a great marriage. Like you said, mm. you could say, and I would argue with you, I would agree with you that he's not doing enough. He's not raising mm. his game to a bigger level. I also don't think that he's been given the the the, the runway to do so. It's not like, okay, Aiton, you're our guy, you know? The mm. last outward sign of support was from Chris Paul when he said, we're going to get Aiton that back. Fast mm. forward now, and yes, he got it, but courtesy of Indiana, not courtesy of Chris Paul. So, like, I feel like you're right in terms of the future here not being great, and I like where you have him ranked because, okay, he's back, and he, like, hearing what he's been saying – you know, he didn't really kind of lay to rest that him and, and Coach Monty Williams have smoothed things over. Mm. He said that their relationship is peaceful, whatever that means. Um, our relationship is peaceful. Like, I don't mm. understand what that means. You know what I mean? Um, you do have the hard feelings that, you, yeah, you had to wait. Son said, we're going to, you know, we, we care about you, but we're going to wait till someone else wants you, and then we'll show you that we want to keep you. That that's that, Ego-wise, that just not is going to be good. You can say all the right things, but – Actions speak louder than words, and I think we all saw the action that was taken toward DeAndre Ayton. So I agree with you. Like, okay, and so if he is back, do you pick up where you left off? You know, like, you still got to erase the demons of that game seven against Dallas. Um, let's say you're able to do that. Let's say, you know, we're moving on from then. Is Ayton long term? Because that is a lot of money, and we know the Suns already didn't want to commit to him to begin with, as we've seen. So it just brings up more questions than answers. I think that you're right. Like this, this signing was just kind of, it had to be done. And now we are fully leaning into the, the fallout. I think that's going to happen here with uh, Aiden and Phoenix. Well, it tells you everything you need to know that Indiana was the big bidder, a team rebuilding, um, mm-hmm. going through a long-term rebuild was the only one willing to really throw the max at him. Like it wasn't like everybody was jumping, crawl, jumping over each other, trying to give Deandre Aiden the max. Like you look at, I'm telling you, like when you, Folks, when you watch the cleaning the glass or go through the cleaning the glass stuff, because like the eye test says he doesn't really impact the game in a significant way. And everyone like the one thing you could cite is what he did in the playoff run where they got to the finals. Like that was the Aiton that is valuable, like the Aiton where he was a monster defensively and he was an awesome, awesome rim protector. And he was just a rim runner and just had so many oops from Chris Paul. Like he was playing like Clint Capella uh, with Houston, uh, Chris Paul at that point. But that's not who he was again last year. And that's not who he wants to be. So I just think it's one of those things where I think Aiton might be a lot better player like six years from now when he realizes he's not a Joel Embiid upside guy where he needs to be Dwayne Dedman and just live in that vortex. And I just he's too young. Like, I don't think he he still sees himself. And I get it. Like, you're young. You were the number one overall pick. You were went ahead Luca and Trey and company like you still see yourself as a franchise guy. He's just not like the DeAndre Ayton can be a good player. Who's not a franchise guy. Like his contract's bad. His contract is not what he's worth. And it like, I just don't think the Suns are going to keep him long-term. Like if you go through it, like his, he's in the zero percentile and offensive rebound percentage on offense. Like he doesn't, it just, you go through it and I'm like, I just don't see it. The numbers don't like him that when you watch the games, you're just like, I don't know. I, I don't know where he goes and what the right move is for him, but I also just really don't see him in uh, in Phoenix for the long term. Maybe the Knicks are like, "Hey, we we're we're doing some stuff. We'll we'll bring him into the fold too, and we'll give you the Knicks." <laughs> that would well, you be just him watch and Mitchell Brunson. Robinson. Yeah, I don't know. Like Julius Randle, I don't know. I very unlikely, and I don't think uh, they want to get in the Julius Randle business uh, outside <laughs> of a career renaissance and. New York this year, but he might not even be in New York. He might be in Utah. We'll see. Um, Number four for me, Malcolm Brogdon to Boston. Um, Malcolm Brogdon is a great theoretical basketball player, and I very much like Malcolm Brogdon. He's in the top four for me where it's like, if he's healthy, he's an extremely interesting move for Boston. Like if he is who he is at his best, like those best Milwaukee years for Boston, they did not have a player like that. They have tried with the young guys, the Nismiths, the Pritchards, this, that, and the other. Now they just have a veteran they know can do it, who you know, like everybody respects. He's a player. He's different. He gets to the rim. He's a completely different kind of watch. I love Malcolm Brogdon as a player. Malcolm Brogdon has not played consistent basketball in a very long time. And the injury stuff is... Re- <laughs>